Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. We'd all love to hit skip on our problems now and again. But using wheat to deal with stress as a teen won't make your issues go away. That's because THC messes with parts of the brain responsible for fear and anxiety, making it even harder to manage them on your own. So even the smaller things can start to feel difficult to handle. Learn better ways to deal with stress at mindovermarijuana.com. That's mindovermarijuana.com. Sponsored by the California Department of Public Health. Audience, wherever you may hail, I'm your host, John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus. Join us as we explore some of the world's most fascinating and essential contemporary developments, shedding a spot of light in a world filled with alternative fact darkness. In this episode, we are joined by Mark Nuttall to speak on pol- modern policing. Mark is Director of Strategic Solutions at Thomson Reuters. Mark has an extensive countercrime background with over 20 years of experience in global risk management and anti-financial crime. He is a security specialist with a background in security, law enforcement, geopolitics, international organizations, financial institutions, and project management. Mark, welcome to The Focus. Thank you very much, John. That was a long spiel, wasn't it? No, Apologies for the long, long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are the man, so you know I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to tell the folk where you come from. So, anyway, Mark, let's get uh, started by asking a relatively, maybe simple, at the top of my head, but probably a bit more difficult to answer uh, question: What do you think modern policing gets right and wrong? Right. Uh, It is. It's a lot to unpack. Modern policing from a uh, westernised perspective, i.e. let's take the United Kingdom, it tends to get right community policing, or it certainly did at the time that I was in it, which was up until around 2016. Community policing meant that it respected the community that it was in. It caught the community's Um, temperature and and went down paths to understand what societal problems were so they could relate that to the other pillars of society and to really concentrate on what was occurring with offenders, why they were offending and not just acting within an enforcement pillar in in a rather Uh, brutesque manner let's put it that way some countries act in a military manner that's up to their legal framework that's up to the way that their country's policies are set out however i still do feel that community policing beat policing and having presence is really the core of what it's all about policing as a whole really in its modern day um frame has only been really around for around 200 years um with pelian policing pelian policing started in the united kingdom which why which is why i use it as kind of my central framework so mark there's been a lot said about data mining integrated with security cameras developing a surveillance state mentality in certain parts of the world where governments come down hard in order to preserve or enhance law and order But these trends aren't just prevalent among states run by one man or one party, but also among traditional democracies as well. Has technology and its utilisation in this manner complicated or liberated the policing mission? I would say it's done both dependent on use of material. So in terms of liberation, it's liberated 
detectives from going round and chasing up elements of um, CCTV from certain local corner shops or having to find a pathway to CCTV or um, that element of, of um, photographic or video led uh, surveillance, whether it or valence, let's put it that way. Let's use valence because surveillance is covert. And, and a, as a result of that, you expect it to be in such a way. We're talking about really overt valence. Uh, and, and the way that that's portrayed often throughout Westernized society or, or liberal societies, let's place it that way, uh, the public normally is aware that there are cameras in the area. Take the United Kingdom, for instance. Uh, I'll, I'll use it as my central point frame because it tends to be the one that places these things in um, uh, at a relevant pace of knots. So let, let's take central London, for example, uh, the ANPR system, automatic number plate recognition system. Um, it obviously publicised that. It publicised where those were going to be, where they were located, and what they were going to be utilised for, so that you know you're under valence, um, and that you know that at some point throughout that processing system, that if you commit a certain offence, um, you are going to be caught for it because it's an automatic number plate recognition system. Um, there are caveats to that, of course, depending on who's driving and for what purpose and if the camera can see inside the vehicle. But it, but essentially, um, the, there are caveats to utilising those systems. It's when it goes into the darker areas of liberated society and it ends up being a, a complete surveillance tool for um, specialist service branches or for branches that just want to monitor activities, uh, movements, processes, um, facial recognition patterns, picking up on patterns of behaviour and patterns of display. That's when it gets into a murkier environment. Now, those that say they want to protect society in terms of uh, activity of individuals, what type of society do they really want to protect? Because if we look at what is supposed to be good and bad in society, then, you know, the majority of time, the bad in society is supposed to be totalitarian regimes that place surveillance upon their society. <laughs> if we do that within let's say, a liberal, democratic, conservative, it doesn't matter, um, a kind of a westernized society, what are we doing it for if we're saying that the bad is constant valiance? You know, having said that, I'm, I'm always wondering, if the police are the recipient of government largesse, say, for instance, a government understands that there are law and order issues that only technology can provide, do the police actually go through that technology and say to the government, well, look, you know, especially in a, in a, in a liberal democracy sense, uh, these technologies are inappropriate for the task at hand? Or do they just suck up that government uh, largesse and say, well, you know, the government's just given us all this, you know, um, fantastic technological benefits so we can go after everything and any anything that happens to uh, tickle our fancy at the moment is is there a is there a level of um police being aware of the sort of powers that they can actually have and are they also pushing back in terms of technology can we trust the police to know what to do with the tech is what i'm really coming down with here that's a long question <laughs> I'll, um, hopefully a uh, long yeah. answer <laughs> yeah. there we go um right can we trust police with technology okay so I'll, I'll start with that one all police services that are dependent upon being given a budget throughout the world typically have a relatively small budget to do a great deal with so if you're talking about police services that act in a Pelian style, i.e. Um, they are looking at community-based policing or even policing as it is within the United States of America, which is 
different to Pelium style um, because of the nature of how it's changed over time and the fact that you've got more of a prosecution-led approach, et cetera, and direction. When you're looking at detection and investigation, uh, you're looking at more of direction via a prosecutor um, than you are, say, within response policing. So if a cop goes out to deal with response policing, he'll deal with it actively, save life and limb. If you're looking at an investigation, it'll typically process through a prosecutor. There are loads of differentials to that because you've got 250 countries. Throughout that, you might even have even more police services um, because you've got regional policing and you've got uh, country-based policing, you've got federal, all these differentials. So you might have you know, roughly around a thousand different types of police services. Yeah. But let's take it on a country basis. Okay. So if you're taking with a budget, within that budget, technology typically only accounts for a very small percentage of that budgetary um, provision. Mm -hmm. Because policing in the main is a HR or, or a resource intensive person service. So you need a human to go around. You need it to do the policing element. There are no robots in, in fashion yet. Even drones can't do the service. You can't take Elon a Musk violence. may have something to say about that, though. Come on. Well, yeah, let's have a chat with him. Let's bring him over. I can have a, I can have a word. He might give me might give me some type of pay rise. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, the way that it functions is still vastly human resource intensive. Because it's human resource intensive, that tends to be where the budget goes, mm -hmm. whether it's administrational staff or sworn warranted officers. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. Small warranted officers should make up a great deal of the percentage of that policing staff. After that, you need control room. Um, so police can communicate with other police or police can communicate with other emergency services to record the, the processes, whether that's digital, whether that's analog, whether that's radio, whether that's more complex communications and, and uh, signal processes, then it depends from country to country to country. Then comes any type of uh, digital body worn camera, Mm -hmm. comes with it any form of case uh, management system, comes with it any type of um, legally processed provision to make sure that you can form your case or you can analyse data that you might have seized from, say, a computer or a phone, etc., which normally goes through a forensic process. I'll come back to the UK again, and I'll yeah. come back to the UK for a reason because it's got uh, it's got a very... Um, solid legal um, process and, and it's got certain elements of acts within it. So the Criminal Justice Investigative Procedures Act, etc. Uh, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, the Proceeds of Crime Act, so CJPA um, and, a and a load of others. And, and what that means is you've got to do things certain ways. You've got to do it to the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it in that way, the case will crumble. There's no point arresting anybody. And if there's no point arresting anybody, there's no point. In, <laughs> you get where I'm going with this. Yep, yep. So that's what forms up a majority of a budgetary expense for policing within a Pelian society. Mm -hmm. Within the UK and certain other jurisdictions, police officers aren't armed. There's only a certain amount of police officers that are armed. So take that technology away as well. Some have been given tasers. Again, take that proportion away as well. And what you are left over with then is not that much budget to spend on what could be deemed to be surveillance type equipment. So I work within a covert unit. Mm -hmm. I was dealing with serious and organized crime. Our budget for those things was relative to the size of the covert unit that we had and the investigations that we were dealing with. Right. In terms of the National Crime Agency, for example, they're the same. It's, it's all about human resource. Pivot that, okay, Pelian principles, to a despot country mm -hmm. where you have got a totalitarian, totalitarian regime. Budgets within those security states are almost endless because that is their function. It's to become a totalitarian regime it's to control individuals and people, and it's to monitor those people. How they get 
that equipment usually is in a kind of a dual goods process list if it's from a military regime process through civilian organizations and private companies or they will go through kind of a, a criminal supply chain to have it implanted into the country because typically they're under sanctions right. if they're under sanctions that that means they can't often get the precursors to that as well because they're under dual those uh, items are under a dual good list process so again it's got to be a criminal supply chain process for them to be able to receive that material and equipment for them to be able to comprise their totalitarian, totalitarian regime if you're looking at um say control through cameras and survey or valiance through cameras typically within like i say um westernized society there are legal frameworks yes okay on occasions those legal frameworks may turn off in the incidence of terrorism under under a reason of terrorism etc when a terrorist incident has taken place so that monitoring can be done to see either what what is going to occur or, or, or where people are going to be and then it'll be switched off at certain times for certain purposes this is you know i'm not telling tales out of school here everything's open um, in relation to when those processes are deemed to be in place and they're publicized uh, in various news articles etc and media you know it, it's interesting though when you read about modern policing and you look at the technological aspects of modern policing and the intrusiveness of this. Again, I have to come back to the idea of who watches the watchers in the Western sense. I mean, will the police take up new technologies and techniques without question, even though they may think that it's skirting the line with regard to civil liberties or will they sit back and think to themselves, holy crap, you know, I mean, we live in a democracy, we are a police force in a democracy. And so therefore, we understand that if we were to roll out all this new surveillance technology, it's going to have a massive impact on the public. I mean, how deep do those internal discussions go to give the public a sense of security? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Let, let's take it to common policing. So yeah. uniform policing, let's get out the special services piece for a moment because they're a different element. But if you're talking about normal policing uh, departments, they normally, so their procurement services will hold a budget and a budget line, et cetera. You then might have specialist departments within those police services that have got certain remits. So covert remit, for example. If you've got something, so in the UK, you cannot use interception material in evidence. Okay. So there's a regulatory of investigative procedures act 2002 that says you can't use that. Okay. So if you want to purchase, so say you're a common man, yeah. And it's the same way for police services or, or uh, uh, defence services. If you're a common man and you want to purchase interception technology, for example, from mostly the only country that makes it at times, which is Israel or mm -hmm. one of the other ones, right. yeah, right. then you have got to go through, unless you are a criminal organisation or an individual that is willing to tell lies, uh, and form a legend, you will go through a great deal of due diligence uh, with the Israelis because of the nature of the dual 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 use goods regime. Yes. Okay. So if you are purchasing that form of equipment first hand, mm -hmm. then um, you will have to go through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 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 so you have to have awareness of that and knowledge of that. If you are buying it secondhand, you will be either buying it off the black market or somebody that is extremely dodgy. <laughs> so as a police service, yeah. um, you would be out of your mind <laughs> to, to go through that, that, that process. Yeah. Here in Australia, um, you, they utilise interception material in courts. So they've got access to interception equipment 
Um, but they've got to still go through their proportionality and necessity processes legally to be able to use that. They've got to go to a court. They've got to get authorization. They've, you know, they've got to get a warrant to be able to use it. So they've got to go through several different journeys and stages to be able to utilize that typology, trade craft, and methodology. It's it's you know it's used in court cases here so it's an open trade craft and methodology i'm not saying anything out of school mm-hmm. um so so as a as a result of that there are a lot of pinpoint watchers and kind of guardians even if they are informal guardians of these methodologies um so take the united states for example there are a million and one police departments in the united states maybe i'm large yes in that but there are quite a there are quite a few there are sheriff's departments there are city departments there are there's the federal departments of all types mm. those little city ones barely have the budget to buy police cars <laughs> no, never mind anything else that is more technical and often they don't know how to get this stuff where to get it from how to utilize it i mean they'd be bumbling around like like nobody's tomorrow because most of them haven't been trained in those methodologies and those and that trade craft mm-hmm. so i would say it's more it, it, it's more that there's a knowledge that things like this exist um and you know i think hollywood has done a very 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 good job mm-hmm. of saying that we're all in this you know crazy tech world mm-hmm we're not uh, and as a former police officer i can certainly say that probably the local corner shop had better technological equipment <laughs> and computing power than than maybe the police service um yeah. because yeah. because contracts within police and i'll say this very openly and everybody knows it contracts within police are often tying contracts so say if you're within with a technology company that's providing you with desktop computers that'll be a five to ten year contract Mm. so that desktop that's set sat at the cops uh terminal might be a five to ten year old dell computer (laughs) you know what i mean that hardly starts up running on windows 95 Mm. so it's uh, for for (laughs) for, yes in totalitarian regimes these things might be commonplace but certainly not in westernized society where Contracts are contracts, procurement's procurement, and in the main, cops are too busy running around either chasing crooks and mopping up messes or being in court to, to, to go kind of committing totalitarian crimes. Actually, you know, you, you touch on a number of really good points here, but of course, I, I can't let this one go because, of you know, in the left of politics, uh, in the civil rights movements, for instance, there's a lot said about the increasing concern of the rapid and per, per, uh, permanent loss of personal security and, and privacy. You know, they, they talk about, you know, the technological penetration of our lives, our likes, our dislikes, and our private foibles, which exposes the individual like never before. So, Mark, in actual fact, the reality falls far short of the Hollywood benchmark, where the Hollywood benchmark says that there is this thing out there that basically gobbles up all the data, sends it off to the local constabulary. They manage to, you know, sift through the data and catch the bad guys. And and sometimes they'll trample on your civil liberties and your privacy as a consequence of the technology that they're using. No. (laughs) <laughs> good answer no 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 right you can't i, I mean i i work for thompson reuters thompson reuters has got one of the largest data pots in the world yep do you think police can afford this data pot <laughs> well well no i mean well, i mean, but, I mean they, this is the uh, so take take private organizations right they have got more access into your life than cops mm-hmm. and they've got more access into your life because people now are embodied with mobile phones yes okay. so mobile mo- yeah 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 <laughs> surveillance devices yeah. they are surveillance devices they are surveillance devices because people want stuff they have got a fear of missing out it, it you know this modern place generation z or whatever comment 
FOMO is, is true. Mm. So they'll download an app. That app has got many, many caveats to it. It's a legally binding contract as soon as you download it. Yes, that's no problem. Fine. Take my data, turn my camera on, turn my mic on, take all my geospatial data, not a problem. For some of the uh, social apps at the moment, I won't name them for fear of being sued, they they take how uh, what the dilation of your pupils are, um, um, how long you're looking in nanoseconds at a certain item, what your facial expressions are, what geospatial um, uh, positioning you are in, uh, have you cut your hair this week? Is it getting too long? Do you need new glasses? Are you salivating? Is your blood pressure up? Because these often take these in line with your phone, the in line with your watch these days, etc., yeah. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. These things are surveillance devices. You have got to have one to live in modern society, so you express consent to it. Not a problem. I've expressed consent to it. I'm talking to you now off a device. This device can follow me from A to B to C to D to D E. It knows what I'm doing. It knows where I'm going. It knows what I like. It knows what I dislike. Mm -hmm. And and that that is the is the is the kind of um, the forward pressure at the moment. Maybe not as much because police. Let let let's let's dig into police just for a second because yeah. I know that we're kind of losing time on this. Could speak all day. Um, but but police at the heart of what policing is meant to be and the peeling principles of why it was set up was to protect society and try to prevent crime in action or past crime. It was originally a reactive rather than a proactive service. In the in the main, policing has still remained a Re uh, reactive service, i.e. 70, 80% of policing in the main, in the majority of forces around the world, is reactive. Mm -hmm. The proactivity element is very slim because the nature of the remit of what the police are there to do. Move away from kind of the militaristic um, formation of policing that is in some countries. Mm -hmm. It's not there as that core police base. Mm -hmm. And I always say this to people, especially... Because when I was in the police in the UK, although I was a very experienced police officer, I've been through many things and understood many things. I was very naive about what police look like in the world until, number one, I'd done a lot of work around the world and experienced policing around the world. And also before I went into Interpol. Yeah. And I can vastly say that the police are not the police are not the police because it wholeheartedly depends on where they are what the legal provisions are in that country, what the expectations are, what the budget is, what society they've grown in, what the culture looks like, and what governance, the tone at the top looks like politically and downwards, because that all forms what a policing culture looks like as well, and the rest of obviously the units that form up governance and, and, and regulation and policy and then enforcement of legislative constructs. In a lot of countries, especially within the Pacific region and certain regions within Asia, you've still got things harking back to colonial times. So in some places, you've still got witchcraft, you've still got buggery legislation, you've still got a whole range of things because things haven't been upgraded. Yeah. Law enforcement is kind of a second thought in that um, we need to make sure that the community aren't killing each other. And we need to make sure that there's limited theft so that we can have kind of an economic framework within the country and it's safe and secure for people to come and invest, go in and out of. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is is over there somewhere yeah. um, within the covert dark and mystic arts, which mm -hmm. is a really small percentage. And then you've obviously got security services dependent on whether they can afford security services in the country. So a lot of the Pacific Islands, for example, don't have, you know, many functions. Their cops are going around with limited clothing and protection and protective clothing. They mm -hmm. can hardly do their job. So that security surveillance mindset isn't even, isn't even on their radar. And that goes across the globe. It depends on geopolitical circumstances, economics of country, safety and security in country. There's a lot to it, and there's so many dynamics to it. 
so okay i mean you you really unpacked that very well but of course thank you the same day di- that the same dimensions um affect us at the serious and organized crime situation yeah. now uh i've just come back from canberra caught up with my cousin who works in you know the technological realm and he told me yeah. some really tragic stories about how people's information gets passed on to third parties and there is no transparency between a social media platform provider for instance to look after personal data they will find their way out into a third party that third party could be a criminal enterprise it could be a corrupt enterprise so mm-hmm. how do then police try to protect the public's sense of themselves at an individual level when corporations say for instance Elon Musk's corporation or perhaps Jeff Bezos's or Mark Zuckerberg's do not want to provide the kind of protections necessary to ensure that third party information doesn't end up in the wrong hands yeah so organizations and i'm not going to name any for fear of being sued <laughs> i've already is, named um, them <laughs> yeah no it's fine you, you crack on <laughs> i'll limit my liability here and now all right um, so so for, <laughs> so for um so for the majority of organizations that are technological organizations they were not set up or they they give very little thought to due diligence risk remediation compliance all those um, kind of ISO 31004 processes that there needs to be within an organization. They were, whether they were set up in the late 90s or they were set up today, and I can, you know, there's no difference between the two apart from the technology that's available now quickly that can deploy it. The situation is that they give very little thought to that. They're thinking in agile sprint manners. They are thinking about the deployment of technology. They are thinking about protecting their IP, not the client. The client is the user. And the user is very rarely thought about apart from as apart from to um, monetize the, the system. Um, so if you work in, in a tech firm that gains its revenue from advertisement, for example, they will be the true client to the technological firm, not the users of the system, because they're the clients of the tech firm's client. That's where the money's made. So the the information process is looked at as a contract between user of platform and the technological vendor and if that individual and and, and in the majority of legal systems you deem to know the legislation if you sign something as we all sign on a day-to-day basis you are committed to that contract Mm -hmm. if within that contract it says that it will uh, you are free that the company is free to give your information to third parties xxx then you have signed up to that, mm-hmm. and and this this is the, this is the problem that we have today. People this, no longer read contract. Mark, I, I I get that, but this is all obviously an exploitative situation. Because, Massively, <laughs> you know, I, I, you and I both know most people don't read the fine print, and mm-hmm. they want the technology to work. And you yeah. know, I, uh, I I said to my cousin uh, just the other day, I said, you know. Um, on the phone, when I read my reports, you know, the reports say, oh, if you want to, if you want to be able to better manage your privacy, you can do X, Y, and Z to your phone. But of course, that means that the phone is in a reduced capacity, all the applications are in a reduced capacity. And we don't want that. We want everything to work. So effectively, we just sign up to all of this stuff, knowing full well, subconsciously at the very least, that our stuff is going to be basically at the beck and call of any tech company that, that has access to it, which, which again, you know, from, from a policing perspective is it's, it's complicated. And and from a consumer perspective, it's complicated because of course we're no longer citizens when corporations 
call us clients or consumers. There are, there are no abiding loyalties. It's all about the money. And if they can get money and extract money out of their clients or consumer, then, you know, all good for them, but not so good for us, right? Good yeah. for the criminal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 exactly. And it's where those fine lines are. And it's where they decide to draw them. Yep. So you, you've got tech organizations that, that very rarely think about the ISO 31000 process, where they're going to draw the line, where their compliance is, where their due diligence is, where they care about client, where they want to make sure the client is first on their thoughts. Hmm. But as I said a moment ago, the majority, uh, well, the, the, the platforms that are monetized via advertisement mm -hmm. are problematic because because the, the clients aren't the users their clients are the advertisers no matter yeah. what those advertisers will like, they might be smes mm -hmm. they might be multinational corporations they might be who knows they might even be individuals who te deem themselves to be influencers these days uh, and mean. they pay for advertisements but they still get the data of those individuals uh, dependent google's the same so you take google's search engine optimization process you can push your website up to the top of the top of the list if you know what you're doing mm -hmm. um might not be the best website in the world but the search op op engine optimization process allows you to to kind of circumvent some of the systems that are in place dependent on what your certain field is and you know i i've used google's search engine optimization myself when i was a um, small business owner so but i know I, I know these things work if, if, if someone was to do something dodgy through these means, and, and obviously these means in cyberspace, um, it, uh, it is, it's an international domain. Yes, it is. Um, local law enforcement is going to have a very hard time being able to move into international jurisdictions where Correct. the um, likelihood uh, of, of knowing where a crime had been committed if a crime had been committed and what and and again you know we, we talk about crime and we talk about uh the internet yeah. what constitutes a crime is it is it a is it a moral <laughs> thing is it an ethical thing is it a physical thing you know when we talk about theft of data we talk about the responsibility of people signing up to clauses they don't understand because it's all too complex you know how much of a uh, how, mu how much blame can you put on the individual punter out there that needs yeah. the stuff uh, and doesn't understand it yeah. versus the people who are exploiting that ignorance? I mean, is there a, a sort of thing that you can sort of say about culpability, for instance? Right? Yeah. So it, it depends on the legal framework within the country that the crimes occurred in and also the jurisdiction that the person is in at, right. as well. Right. So if you, let's go for the UK again, why not? I know the legislation. So fraud by false representation in the UK, you've got to have a false representation to make the crime out. Yeah. Uh, in the main, um, the majority of, of, of fraud is theft. So if there's a fraud by false representation, false representation, false representation has been made. OK, usually it's in some type of documentation format. So if a false re a false um, representation has been made, for example, and it's led to a fraud and there's, a, there's attempts of this as well. So let, let's leave the attempts to one side because they're yeah. very painful and they're very hard to prosecute as well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so let's let's say that the theft has been made out the taking acquisition of A, B, C, or D, whatever the asset might be, money or crypto or whatever. Then what what needs to occur in that process? Pretend it's been made out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've got a fraudster is made a um, fraud by false representation. It's been a false representation, whatever that lie may be on documentation. You know, there's. I, I've sold somebody an uh, orchard of apples in France, for example, and it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, very simple thing. Contract's been signed, everything's been there, but that doesn't exist. Fraud by false representation. Easy. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen to get the evidence from France, for example, mm -hmm. that that doesn't exist, because you can't just use Google Maps, for example, yeah. Um, you've got to understand uh, what the who the owner of that is, what the plot looks like, where it is. 
you have then got to request, say in the UK, if I'm a police officer in the UK, I've then got to go to the Crown Prosecution Service, who will write a um, who will write through the um, U- through the UK criminal justice um, system for a um, commission rogatoire or a letter of request. It's a legal process that will then go over to um, the relevant competent authority. Two competent authorities in the UK. There's competent authority, and then there's a competent authority in France. Goes to France then what they'll need to do is authorise that that's um, in correlation to something that they can deal with. They will then go and do the relevant action, the, 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 um, the police service in France for that region will go and do the relevant action that has been requested on my commission rogatoire, okay? letter of request. That process might take a year, two years, three years, 10 years, dependent on the other jurisdiction, their processes, procedures, timelines, and actually their motivation to go and do it. They don't have to do it. It's just a request. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's certain uh, United Nations conventions that deal with this at the top level, mm-hmm. but it, but, it, but essentially it's up to them how, how long they take to deal with it. Mm-hmm. I've had things that I asked for and I haven't received them until the end of a court case and then four years later. OK, so that gives you an indication of how quickly the bureaucracy moves and it is a paper process. It's got to be sent. It's got to be signed. It's got to be delivered, et cetera, right. dependent on jurisdiction. Right. So when you're talking about these things, it doesn't move as quickly as the crime or the criminal yep. Um, yep. It moves in a bureaucratic, administrational fashion mm-hmm. and You've got to remember as well that there's an investigation process that needs to take place and there's a crime report that's got to be allocated to a detective once it's been reported to a police station. These investigations, these simple frauds, let's let's put it that way, massive inverted commas, these simple frauds might take four to five years to get from A to just getting an individual, say, to court. Could take one year, could take two years, dependent on where the individual is that's committed the offence, mm-hmm. where the offence has been committed itself, and where substrates of that offence might have been committed, or where the contractual detail is in regard to it. Okay, I I, I, ha- I have an observation that I try to keep <laughs> toward the Does end that... of this podcast, but you, you're doing really well. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, now, look, um, when we recently caught up in Adelaide, one of the topics of conversation and something that you've already raised earlier was, pol- you know, community policing. Yeah. From your international experience, do countries value this old fashioned notion of policing or do they prefer the paramilitary, heavily armed look? It, it depends on the flavour of the day within the country. So if I popped off to North Korea, then it's going to be a totalitarian military regime. If I if I popped off to sunny sunny Brixton, for example, in in the UK, then community based policing would typically be the be at the heart of it. It might have adapted to response policing and some uh, reactive forms of detection work, but at the heart of it, you your client per se is the victim Mm -hmm. yeah so it's all about the community and it's all about the people within it um so it it all wholeheartedly depends on the regime of the country what the country looks like what the culture is within that country i know say in the country that i'm living in singapore for example it might seem like a stern police service Mm. but they they are at one with each other Mm -hmm. so and, and when I say at one, they have got uh, national service within the policing construct as well. Right. So fam- family is within that system. And the, the, the process is to rehabilitate people if they end up within the system. So the rehabilitation system within, say, Changi prison environment, for example, is exemplary. Mm-hmm. Um, people go into driving cabs, they go into a really successful rehabilitation process 
for the community within Singapore. So even when it looks like it might be a, a tough policing service, you know, not necessarily in relation to the crimes in Singapore, because they are they are kind of lighter crimes, heavy, heavy penalty. Um, but even then, it, it looks like a hard police force because everybody's armed, everybody's yeah. you know, you know, quite stern. But it's it's at one with each other. It's about the community, mm-hmm. um, you know, even though they might be quite stern about what they're doing because they want to rehabilitate the, the people. They don't want crime mm-hmm. because that's going to affect their status within the world or a low crime environment. They don't want that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they don't want a totalitarian regime because <laughs> they understand that it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and then I've dealt with a whole range of police and infrastructures in the world with the most gentle, lovely people in them mm-hmm. that truly care about the community that they're in, that truly love poli- policing and, and, a, and a community-based policing. These people might not be in those type of policing structures. They might be in a kind of a military regime structure, if you will, you know, a, a rankage colonel, general, lieutenant. Yeah. Yeah. However they are still doing it for their community because they've joined a police service or a police force, which means that criminal legislation is typically in the main towards the benefit of the, uh, of the um, society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you will, that's the point of having, you know, criminal, criminal legislation. So, so yeah, there are, there are regimes, there are totalitarian regimes, there are military led um, police services around the world. But in the main, as I stated, it, it, it's at the heart of a, of a, of a cop is actually community mm-hmm. because you, I've met, I've met police officers. I obviously have a work police officers that are, are bullies, you know, people that are, are nasty pieces of work. Mm-hmm. They get weeded out of the system mm-hmm. um, as long as the system is right. And, and in the majority of instances, I've met right systems. I've met systems that want to make sure that the citizens within the country are looked after, mm. that they're not abused. There are many countries that abuse their citizens. I understand that and I get it. But even when I've been to countries like Myanmar, for example, the police service that I was dealing with in Myanmar at that time, back in 2018, 2019, were lovely, lovely people mm. who were just there to look after the community they, they cared about the community it might be a different regime now or mm. kind of the old regime put into a new regime mm. but their policing structure the one that sat there previously were delightful people who just wanted to serve the community it's now a military regime again led by military individuals so we'll see how that plays out in due course you know it's it's interesting because i mean locally here we went through a community policing surge many many years ago and then of course you know various governments have come in and they've all decided to consolidate policing assets in regional locations far removed from the people i like to say that they're like police station palazzos where all their technology and their cars are and then they go out in their cars they don't speak to anybody they run around in their their uh, reflecto shades looking very intimidating. And, you know, I suppose in a sense that may intimidate the people that they want to intimidate, but at the same time for everyday people, everyday people would want to feel more secure by being able to speak to the copper on the beat. Like it used to be decades ago when you did have the copper walking up and down, having a couple of, uh, having a cup of tea and having a chat about the local neighborhood, for instance, we don't have that anymore because I think that we've gone through this, uh, you know, run of technology, sophistication, neoliberal downsizing, you know, and this is where we are in terms of modern policing. Well, at least from, from, you know, an Australian perspective, mm. not necessarily the best thing to do. It doesn't give you the same sense of security uh, because yeah. you don't, you can't reach out. The police seem removed and distance from the community that they Correct. serve. Yeah. So what, what, what do you say about, you know, when that happens in a democracy and, and the, how that affects yeah. Yeah, there, need, there needs to be there needs to be a balance because cops need to see people. They yeah. need to interact with people because yeah. if you're not if you're not interacting with the community, yeah. then you all you're ever doing is seeing bad people. Okay, so 
right. say say within my last tenure within the police, for example, mm-hmm. I was dealing with serious and organised crime consistently. Mm-hmm. You you begin your mind just that that's all you're seeing. You're digging in, you're mm-hmm. you're evaluating, you're investigating. That's that's what you're seeing. You're communicating with the outside world on your off time, obviously. So you you're a part of the community. Thankfully, I lived in London, so I was part of the community that I was in. Yeah. It's when you maybe have cops that all they're doing is seeing villains all day long. Mm-hmm. They see badness all day long. And then they might go to a suburb that's far removed from where their main community-based policing is. Mm-hmm. That's when it creates a problem. And there's some questions about living in the community that you're serving. But if you're living in a city, it's a little bit different, mm-hmm. you know. And if you're in covert units, there's a difference as well, but. Yeah. You know, the, the, there's always differences. Um, but in terms of when you are police, so so take your village policing or take your policing that I was speaking about earlier where the cops are kind of flobbling about without any proper equipment to close or whatever. Mm-hmm. The, the bad proportion of the people that are in those communities are the ones that they can identify relatively easily because mm-hmm. they're, within a, they're within a community where the bad stand out and the good are there, the normal communities there. So they know everybody within their community, like an old village Bobby might do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're actually better off, <laughs> those guys, mm-hmm. than the guys that are in these big cities, as I, as I was, but I had a different calibre on it. Mm-hmm. Your, your country is a very big country. It's the sixth largest country in the world. Mm-hmm. And as a result, and, and its, its population is, is rather low for a country of its size. As a result of that, you've got far spread kind of disposier across, across the country. Mm-hmm. What you might find is that, if, say you went up to Darwin, for example, and you potted around Darwin for a bit, and there's some police officers sat there, I don't know, eating fish and chips or doing whatever you do in Darwin. Who knows these days? Eating fish getting and chips, weapon, yeah. Getting, getting, and crocodile. Getting, yeah, they yeah, eat yeah, crocodile yeah. over there. <laughs> getting, getting, a, getting a very hot sweat on, yeah, that yeah. type of thing. You might find that the cops up there are completely different to your experience down here yeah. or in Adelaide, Melbourne, uh, Brisbane. I, so I, I saw far, far more police officers kind of milling around in uh perth Mm -hmm. because obviously they've got the opportunity to do that in perth then i wouldn't do here so i'm in melbourne at the moment i've just attended the aipio conference and spoke at that all i've heard since i've been in melbourne is police sirens Mm -hmm. i haven't seen any police on the streets but i've seen them in cars right okay that again creates kind of a disaffection because you've just got police driving around yep. instead of on the streets walking around, just seeing what's going on and, and kind of engaging with the community and seeing what's what's happening and what concerns the community have got as well. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter whether that community is tourism or whether that community is local or yep. whether that community is imported from around the around the suburban areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to take the temperature as you would do anywhere of, of what's going on within your city or else all you're going to do is just respond to incidents in probably the same locations as you've always responded to them and just have exposure to badness consistently mm-hmm. and for you like you were saying john you your your opinion is right okay well they're just out in the middle of nowhere they, they never see us they're not interacting with us they're not looking after maybe my needs as a as a citizen or the needs of my co-patriots as a citizen they're just responding for a b c or d yes they're creating a semi-safe environment for me to be able to do my work or business in because they're mm-hmm. kind of collecting the individuals that are committing the crimes or perpetrate to commit the crimes. But at the end of the day, they are not within the community and hence they are a foreign object that I see that creates maybe a sense of fear in myself or others. So I I, I do understand that and I do get that. But then again, I have seen the other side of the coin and maybe throughout your travels throughout Australia, there might be some difference depending on which jurisdiction you enter into. Look, I, I don't doubt that for a moment. And, you know, even mm. even on my foreign travels, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that in countries that you would expect would have more of a, 
kinetic approach to policing, maybe in Middle e- in the Middle East. I mean, I've come across people in the uh, UAE Interior Ministry, and they have been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And they <laughs> seem to understand yeah. the the um, the benefits of reaching out into the community and finding out what's going on and yes. building those those networks of trust in the yes. community, yeah. which is something that we seem to have. Well, I mean, look. It, it appears from an outsider looking at the system. It seems that that's what we have lost here in Australia. Yeah. I, I had the opportunity to speak to our newly elected premier um, recently, and I did actually raise community policing. And he, he, he assured me that what they are doing is that they're actually going through the whole process and hopefully within another mm, year, once their uh, you know, uh, internal recommendations have been put forward, um, there'll be a, a greater emphasis on community policing. I, I, I applaud that if that's the case, but as you and I both know, in the political realm, it's a movable feast <laughs> and things tend to get forgotten after a period of time, but I'm hoping that this is the case because it, so far he looks like a, a reasonable premier of South Australia, so fingers crossed on that. But of course, in the United States, uh, there are many law enforcement agencies that are increasingly upgunned because of the prevalence of large caliber semi-automatic weapons in the hands of the general public, as well as criminal gangs. Has this development made major U.S. cities any safer? The, the gun argument is for America to get a grip of countries that have guns that have got a license wrapped around them will have, because it's a tool at their disposal, large amounts of gun deaths or firearms deaths Mm. or fatalities or injuries, because people are using them, using them in the wrong, we'll say the wrong way, although lethal barreled instruments are precisely for that reason Um, unless they are made specifically for hunting sport. Mm -hmm. And even then, there's a large amount of uh, fatalities and causal uh, casualties that occur as a result of utilising a hunting firearm. Things like uh, automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons, anything that is made to kill another individual, I am not fully understanding of why they are in the hands of a civilian individual within any country for that matter it doesn't matter whether it's the united states whether it's south africa whether it's here whether it's anywhere they shouldn't be in the hands of human beings human beings you give them a tool they will find the easiest and fastest way to plunge it into their legs. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. you know what? Yeah. What do you do when you're a kid and you get a knife? You stick it all over. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? And the yeah. old game with a knife on the hand, yeah. bang, 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 like in Aliens and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, humans, humans will look at a tool and do anything with it. And pe- people can bring up the argument a thousand times and one about kind of a pioneer mentality in relation to firearms Mm. but at the end of the day we are in 2022 and we are not living uh, no matter in the world where in the world you are um, uh, in a a condition that should be equivalent to a to a war zone there are war zones available if people want to go and, and be in war zones we might stop them um but in terms of in terms of a civilian society that's supposed to be at peace with one another Mm. i have no idea i have no i have zero clue as to why firearms are available to people and people ring round arguments as, as to it in terms of police having access to large caches of weapons it's kind of um, whose junk is bigger? Let's put it that way. I've used a very cautious word there. Um, it's it's right. Okay, these guys, these armed guys within my territory, my jurisdiction that I'm policing, have got access 
to automatic weapons that are war equivalent, that are yeah. military grade weapons. Yeah. Can I defend against that? Mm. No, I cannot. Mm. Uh, and in the first instance, like I said a moment ago, they shouldn't be in the hands of those individuals or a large proportion of society. Because if you, like I say, if you give a load of toddlers in a play school a box of knives, what are they going to do? <laughs> <laughs> they will be experimenting yeah, with yeah, extreme yeah. prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know it's yeah. a, it's a, it's the same thing mm -hmm. you give people those tools they will utilize the tool at their disposal yeah. and people want to play with things naturally mm -hmm. so where you've got a large open plot of land at the back of your house and you decide to go out and buy a machine gun and fire it in so that you can try your target practice mm. people in inner cities don't have that option yeah. So automatically, you know, if I if I had a firearm in this room, I'd be looking at oh, this looks what well, it's just sat there. It's just waiting for me to do something with it. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to clean it. I'm going to play. Mm. Oh, I wonder if it works. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It's like it, it, it's people yeah. naturally have that bent, mm -hmm. and the reason why police have got to kind of get more or better is because they've got the battle with the individuals that are there trying to cause menace and mayhem to um, to the rest of civilian society in those inner city locations or even out of inner city locations. We've seen the terrible and traumatic events from school shootings, mm -hmm. from college shootings, university shootings. Las Vegas, for example, was uh, another. Yeah. I mean, that, that seems to have dribbled under the radar, but yeah. there's lots of conspiracies in relation to what were going on there. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that was that was quite a quite an event that went on there and it was military grade and it was <laughs> I, I wouldn't have liked to have been at that crime scene put it that uh, way definitely not definitely not yeah uh, i'm john bruni and you're listening to sage international's the focus podcast and we're speaking with thomson reuters mark nuttall on pol modern policing and its various challenges Mark, crime is becoming far more digitized, as we were talking earlier. As technology becomes more sophisticated, mafia syndicates and other serious organized transnational criminal outfits like bikey gangs are using the dark web to peddle their illicit products and services online. Who's winning the digital race now, the criminals or the police? Criminals. <laughs> well that was blunt <laughs> simple answer yeah police, police apart from very specialist niche units within law enforcement do not want to go onto the dark web because they will be committing offenses themselves wow what? As soon as soon, as what? soon <laughs> yeah yeah what no not in terms of them committing well yeah because you've got to remember what's on the dark web they might stumble onto porn site that has got a load of uh, disturbing images on it. As yeah. soon as you've got those disturbing images on your computer and you've opened them up and you don't have sufficient authority to be able to view them within a skiff or a, um, a strap oh, environment, man. then you are entering into it. You've opened them up. You've seen them. You've got copies of them in your cache on your computer. You are then subject to that legislation. But you're the police. It doesn't matter. If, I, if I'm not authorised to, to, to investigate and I, I don't have the requisite authorities to be able to open those pages up, I, I'm committing the offence myself. Wow. So you go digging around in drug sites or... Pretend, pretend that you're foolish enough to go, oh, well, I'm just going to do a test purchase on this yeah. and then get that purchased over. But I don't know how they pay for it in the first place, but yeah. then get that purchased over. You've committed the offence. You haven't got the authorities to be able to do it, to do that test purchase. You've got to be in a specific environment that is authorised to do that within that specific environment to go and do that process. But you it's not just a, my ignorance. I, I thought I thought that the police had the mandate to pursue, you know, criminals operating on the dark web, and they had the mandate to use forensic evidence that they, you know, could gain from the dark web in order to get the bad guys. I mean, this is actually quite a so, 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 
Yeah. So, so when I was say say when tech first came around, and I was investigating um, a uh, child sexual exploitation digital uh, photo investigation, mm-hmm. I had to essentially put that onto a stand. That material I had to be forensicated mm-hmm. by a specialist um, forensic officer or ind- member of staff that that I had to justify. To a, at the time, I, I was a detective constable, at the time that I then had to do proportionality and necess, uh, necessity on um, with the uh, inspector to be able to plow out that that could then go to a forensic officer. The forensic officer then dealt with it in a certain way. It then came back to the police station on a, on a very securitized disc. Mm. I then utilized the standalone system that was secure to be able to run through and rate all those different images of which there were around 5,000 different images that I had to rate on a copine scale. I then had to rate those images on a copine scale and write out exactly what I'd seen and when I'd seen it and to what purpose. Um, I then sealed that evidence back up in that bag. That statement was wrote. That went to the Crown Prosecution Service. I couldn't just go hodgepodging across the system and then create copies and and show them to X, Y, Z. I had to describe and run through those things, even within the setting of an interview room. I couldn't then be opening that up for my alternate officer who might have been in the room to be able to view those things or make a copy, say, to take that, because that's making a copy of an illicit image or child pornography. You can't do any of that. That's against the law. All right. Um, so, but but so, that says something about the bureaucracy behind policing, which means that while you're going through your your you know your rigid investigations according yeah. to whatever system you're going through, yeah, you know, other children could be you know abused or harmed, um, and the the um, the speed with which you can apprehend the criminals is going to be sort of kicked down the road somewhat, I would imagine, right? So, so back then, there was no facial recognition. Right. There was no processes to, to put these things through. I, I, I appreciate what happens these days in relation, uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm not in police service anymore, so I couldn't say exactly what the procedure is. But from speaking to some colleagues, that material is now um, kind of added to a secure database. So it right. sits there and it does facial recognition patterns and kind of squeals out you know, puts noise over whatever might might be going on within that certain image. And then the those facial recognition pa- patterns and images are then corresponded to other matters across the globe. Right. So I believe that there is something there in place at the moment for things like that. But it's a very, very, very tightly constrained niche approach. The dark web, mm. the dark web has got to be dealt with with the utmost kid glove scenario. Mm-hmm. Because everything that on that that is on there is essentially criminal in nature. There's very few kind of like like the systems that we used to use because the the dark web essentially is the old web. Mm-hmm. It's it's forums, chat rooms, what Yahoo Geo Cities or its precursor used to be mm-hmm. forums, P two P. That's that, that type of thing. LimeWire and all those other forums, ICU two, and all those systems. Well, what essentially, you know, it was a peer-to-peer, it's a no-to-note. That's yeah. what the dark web really is. And now it's encapsulated under the onion. So when the onion, when the US military created the onion and it then got leaked out and it's now used to protect peer-to-peer or point-to-point processes, it's onion address to onion address now that that's, on, that's available on the, on the net so to speak Mm -hmm. um so you put your onion address in and then you enter into whichever world you want to enter in under this kind of private network or the vpn network that the onion has created for for the world you know it's 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 essentially put a mask over it so people people um, create that onion address and then utilize that onion address to create their specific websites and do the deals or have the chats that they want to have. But you need to know what that onion address is before you go searching. Mm. There are, there are addresses that are available that are onion catalogs. Mm. So you can then see where you want to go as you would on 
what used to be the whole geo cities where you used to enter onto it and it say, you know, um, I don't know, forum to chat about mice or forum to chat about the works of J.R. Tolkien. It's 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 yeah. a different thing now. You know, is uh, a website about firearms. Is a website about this. Is a website about stolen credit cards, mm-hmm. etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But you need to be within a specialist unit that can process that evidence yeah. so that you're not committing offences yourselves. Because in many countries now across the world, there's, there's offences under that catalogue and remit of, of traditional crime, and now they're creating cybercrime offences as well. So law enforcement officers aren't immune from prosecution. You know what I mean? They've got to have justification. They've got to have necessity. In certain circumstances, they've got to have authorization. And that's the case with the onion, is that, yes, a citizen can just go on to the onion. But the majority of times, the onion is wholeheartedly inclusive of crime. So if you then start pressing on buttons and going, my mind really needs to explore what's going on here, that's when I caveat and go, do you really want to be diving into what the onion is and what it looks like? At a top level, you can see what you're going to press. Mm. So if you're looking on kind of this, this search, kind of this, the, 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 uh, the library catalogue of, of where you want to go, you know that you're going to go looking at stolen credit card numbers. If you're going to go looking at stolen credit card numbers, why are you doing that? For what purpose? Yeah. What good can can ever come of that? You want to go and look at, um, imagine if you went down to your pub, okay, down to your bar, mm. and you went, right, okay, uh, I'm going to see the bloke over there who's in the dark corner. Mm. That's uh, Excuse me, mate, uh, excuse me, can I, can I see your cache of firearms, please, mm. or your drugs? You're then entering into a conspiracy for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're yep, attempting... Yep, you're attempting those processes. Mm. Is it the same online? Of course it's the same. But people, when they put, when there's a keyboard in front of them mm. or there's a screen in front of them, they think all of a sudden it's a different matter. It's not. Yeah. It's yeah. really not. If I, as a, if I, as a cop, went down and did that same process and I was kind of engaged in an um, unauthorised covert activity, to pretend to buy that person's things. It's an unauthorized test purchase or it's an unauthorized surveillance activity. It's yeah. the same with the it's the same with the internet. Oh, that's, yeah. that's really interesting. I'm glad I learned that. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, in in terms of uh, uh, three more questions, Mark, if you don't mind. I know we're no going a little bit over time, but the conversation is really fascinating. Um, what role does corruption play in the continuance of serious transnational organized crime? And how does one combat that? <laughs> Complex geopolitics and economic <laughs> um, acceleration within countries would combat that. Right. In all countries, without the bar or without doubt, there is some form of corruption somewhere because people are people. In terms of certain jurisdictions, the corruption and the culture is higher than others in some cultures as well. And I framed it within a chapter within one of the books that I've um, uh, had the honor to to write about the difference between what corruption is and what bribery is as well. And looking that a lot of a lot of cultures that do not pay their civil service well, It's within the cultural framework for them to ask for facilitation payments Mm -hmm. for, say, the allowance of a truck to go down a road or for some minor incursion of a piece of legislation to to occur. They then ask for $50, $100, two rupees, I don't know, whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. because then they've got to kind of pay for their family. They've got to pay for their subsistence and it's accepted within the community it's accepted within their peer group it's accepted within culture to do that and then an outsider looks in and goes that's bribery that's corruption well not in my culture it's not it's it's just me earning my living because i don't get paid enough money yeah um so yes um serious and organized crime can be facilitated either by a process like that where there's I'm going to use the word 
innocent, where there's kind of an innocent understanding or a naive understanding of what they are doing within their own culture, within their own peer framework. And we all know there's a vast remit of that throughout the ASEAN countries. Mm. And then there's the serious corruption. There's the judges, there's the doctors, there's the lawyers, there's the very senior police officers that authorise um, people to come off red notices or people to walk the streets or for executions to take place or for a consign- multiple consignments to enter countries of whatever illicit article it might be or whatever illicit article it might be to exit the country to somewhere else where it's illicit. So yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of it mm. um, dependent on country and nation. And then there's a minimal minimal amount of serious corruption, but a lot of bribery in certain locations as well. Yeah. Uh, they've tried to stamp that out in Western countries and, and what I'll call Anglophile countries. Um, they've, they've tried to, but it's it's still there. Uh, it'll still continue because people are people. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter what what. <laughs> what type of infrastructure you're in, and police are kind of put on a pedestal to, to 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 be there to enforce law. But at the same time, if um, if they are people, they can allow themselves to be open to this. And it depends where they've come from as well, and what background they have. You know, they might be from a boarding school background, for example, or from a really eloquent background, mm. and still decide to do it because. Mm they've got a position of power now and their position of power that allows them to circumvent systems, Mm. et cetera. Mm. Um, Or they might be from a a, a really humble background and they might not decide to do that. Mm. You know, they they, they might say, they might be well against all of that nonsense and buffoonery because that's what it is at the end of the day. In westernised society, you've got good pay in the main You've got good um, or relatively good, you know, for kind of where you where you end up. Um, you've got decent pay. You've got decent perks. You've got decent privileges. Um, some of those may be eroding in certain countries at the moment because of mm-hmm. politics. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you're better than the gentleman that's getting paid nothing, hardly has any kit or clothes, yeah. and he's fighting to survive as well as not having anything to be able to survive off. There are people who claim that if we'd only decriminalize certain activities, such as the use of recreational drugs, we'd be denying criminal groups their ability to profit from this enterprise. But is this sort of judgment correct in your view? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, I recently went, and I'll be quite open about this. I used to be uh, what was known as a drugs expert witness for a Majesty's Court service through the Metropolitan Police Service. I was a certified drugs expert witness. I wrote lots and lots of papers. I wrote lots and lots of statements. I did lots and lots of work in that field. And I used to do valuation, uh, commodity profiling, movement commodities, etc., cetera, uh, which were fully accepted in court. Um, I, I went to various drug expert witness meetings throughout the years, some conferences, tackling drugs, changing lives conferences. And some of the officials within those conferences were that fed up with battling their head against a wall from, you know, from mm. cannabis fines or arresting people for this or arresting people for that. But at the end of it, they just kind of went, you know, should we have a discussion about the legalisation of these drugs? Mm-hmm. And some people said yes, and some people said no, depending on their experience, their background. Mm. I recently went over to San Diego, where obviously it's in San Diego is in, in California. And they, in their infinite wisdom, uh, California as a state have legalised cannabis. Mm. Now, People can have their opinions on cannabis, whatever way it may tune up. But at the end of the day, it's a drug that affects your processing and your ability to interact um, to your full cognizant capacity. And it was a gateway drug to other drugs because you need to satisfy yourself as a human being that you get the same rush at the same bus from things. So it was a gateway drug previously. The trouble is that gateway has now been removed 
Mm-hmm. So when I went to San Diego, all I witnessed, and, and I went throughout San Diego, um, all I witnessed was kind of a hue of green smoke throughout the entire city. Mm-hmm. The majority of people that I interacted with, including people in hotels, people in service industry, uh, people throughout the infrastructure who were high as kites, uh, really speaking to them was difficult. Everything smelled of the stuff. And then the streets were overflowing with people who either wanted to be homeless or were homeless because they were made homeless through either their drug addiction or not being able to afford anything. In the vast amount of Maine, from what I saw during my time, they were screaming and wailing drug addicts who clearly had a problem with methamphetamine. Because that now, in the replacement of cannabis being the gateway drug, has become the gateway drug. And when you remove a gateway, when you remove the toll, the people will naturally go to the next thing. And with cannabis being so oftenly available now, and available to individuals who might not have even gone anywhere near it, the next stage is to move on to to the gateway drug and and i feel that the legislation often especially when it's global legislation of which drugs certainly fall within that remit and i haven't been to many places where drugs are or controlled substances aren't controlled substances it, that legislation is there for a reason and it's there for a damn good reason Uh, It's because we don't want society sedated to uh, a level where they cannot function, Mm -hmm. where society is is too zoned out to to be able to understand that maybe it's not the right time to cross a road or or, or that sedated that they now move on to the next big thing, which is is meth. Mm -hmm. And, And meth is not something that you want your average child or individual to try mm-hmm. and let's face it the the starting age for drug use is typically between what 11 and 15 so mm-hmm. you get on you get on meth at that age mm. you're not coming back for a minute yeah and i i did i did witness a lot of a lot of homes a lot of homeless that, that weren't just homeless and, and, and I understand what that looks like. I really do from a personal level. These were these were methed out individuals fighting, screaming, shouting, obviously mentally, a little bit mentally as well. How do you see policing develop over the next few years, Mark? I mean, arguably, the political and social issues facing us all, no matter where we live, are going to be fraught as food and energy prices spike and the business and employment sectors struggle to pick up the slack. The poorer people are, the more likely they'll turn to crime to top up or completely replace their income streams to make ends meet. Yeah, depends on jurisdiction again. Um, I, I see that Singapore will be fine. Mm. I see the way that Singapore will manage its problems is economically and societally. I believe that that, even though it's a relatively small jurisdiction to be able to handle that can be mimicked and intimate and and i'd say that in uh, i'd say that there needs to be a look again at uh, a national service model for various countries and i know that countries don't really have an appetite for that anymore but Mm. we're finding especially within service or force or, or whatever it might be throughout the world that many youngsters don't want to join these organizations that it's either too difficult these days or there are far easier ways to go about leading your life Mm -hmm. than becoming an integral part of society there's many 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 good people and many good youngsters that are out there that do Mm -hmm. but there's not enough of them and i think all the current recruitment rates globally are showing that that there's not enough people going into these society, these sectors. And I think the reason for that is because post-World War II and post-Cold War and post 
uh, kind of cancellation of, of conscription or cancellation of national service, mm -hmm. that has dragged down. So there's not been the family that have necessarily gone into it because we all know that if, you're, if your family was in a force and there was a pride of motion, whether it be policing or whether it be military or firefighting or whatever, whatever service it might be, yeah. typically the generations would go into that as well. It is true. Now that that has started to subdue over the past, I'd say, probably 50 years, 40 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. there's less and less and less and less individuals that are now going into those those services and forces because they don't have any understanding or any kind of feel or want or purpose to do that and i think i think everybody's seen that globally apart from where there are national service or construction level processes because certainly within the united kingdom i know that they're having real difficulty trying oh, to recruit you're in australia uh, as well may i yeah, say yeah yeah uh, because because kids want you know, and this is not saying that all kids, I met some very, it's AIPI, our conference, I met some very, very, very good, very passionate people, mm. both within law enforcement and within uh, analysis, etc., that were really passionate and wanted to do the job, but they were few and far between. And uh, it, it's not, you know, the easy money, the tech, the influence in the, all this stuff, is seemingly where the youngsters want to go these days. And no matter what people say in terms of, oh, well, they're going to cyber crime or they're going fighting the cyber, cyber baddies. At the end of the day, cyber is digital. Yeah. Being stabbed in the eye is physical. <laughs> and there's more stabbings in the eye yeah. than there will be anything else. Because at the end of the day, if my computers get wiped out, they get wiped out. Hard. Yeah, what, what can I do about that? Mm. If somebody comes up and chops my arm off, I yeah, can't yeah. do without that. Uh, somebody burns my house down, I can't do without that. Mm. If they turn the electric off or the water off, I can't do without that. And mm. I couldn't use my computer in the first place if I've got an electric. Right. So people, people are forgetting about this. They're forgetting about that there's a reality to everything. Mm. Uh, um, and that goes with our forward society as well mm. is that the, the the kind of forgetting it i mean interpol released a metaverse um thing the other day in relation to you know kind of spending a lot of money on on infrastructure for a metaverse presence but guys you it's about the physical stuff yeah. the physical stuff is where it's at it's where it needs to take care of if you don't have physical security around a building Guess what? It doesn't matter how much digital protection you've put in. Somebody's mm. going to rocket a car through the wall. <laughs> and, and Absolutely. I think that's my, my words on it, is that into the future, there needs to be a rethink about where our next generations are going. Not, not to try and coax them into it, mm. but to say, look, we need, we need society. We need a society that, that can trust each other. And we need a society that can look after each other. And I think Singapore has done a very, very good job of that. I think they really have. Well, Mark, that brings uh, this podcast to a close. Thank you very much for sharing your insights on the focus this evening. No, thank you, John. It's an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you. Director at Thomson Reuters, Mark Nuttall. That's it for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed the show. My thanks to our guest, Mark Nuttall, and producers Neil Smart and Malcolm Hughes. Thanks also to the Ozcast Network. You can find the focus on the Sage International website at sageinternational.com.au, hitting the Media Centre drop-down menu and clicking Podcasts. The focus can also be heard on the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Audible, and iHeartRadio. We also have our The Focus Raw YouTube channel, where you can access our unabridged podcast interviews. So if you like what you've heard, please like and review us on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. Until next time, I'm John Bruni, and you've been listening to Sage International's The Focus.
local Safeway for great spring savings throughout the store. This week at Safeway, get yellow peaches or nectarines for the member price of $1.88 per pound. Also this week at Safeway, value packs of Signature Farms chicken drumsticks, thighs, leg quarters, or picnic packs are buy one, get one free. Plus, get value packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Top Sirloin Steak for the member price of $4.99 per pound. Visit Safeway.com, download the Safeway for You app, or head in store to find more great deals at Safeway. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.